You're listening to the Hawk Media Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping entrepreneurs and executives crush the digital marketing game. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. Let's get into the show. All right, you're listening to Hawk Talk. I'm here today with Clarence Greenwood of Citizen Cope. How you doing? How you doing, man? What's going on, Eric? Thanks for coming on. Thank so you. always like to start it similarly with, you know, did you start out two years old, guitar in hand, singing? Like, where did it all start? Take me back to like, where are you from your childhood, so to speak? Um, quick answer is no, I didn't, I didn't start with a guitar and uh, jumping around. Um, I was actually born in Memphis, Tennessee. I only lived there for a short amount of time and then moved uh, to Greenville, Mississippi there for a short time but i moved to washington dc at five six years old so i moved to northwest part upper northwest section uh and was kind of like had kind of lived in that 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 area of of kind of the deep south also had my father's side of the family was from a rural part of texas called vernon Mm -hmm. so um there was and where i was living in in greenville at the time was kind of open like an open farm type house uh but it was like more you know there's a lot of open land and everything uh it was just a house on a bunch of you know land that was um were your parents musicians like what what drew you to that no my mother i think my mother was artistic my natural father was was probably a pretty good writer Mm -hmm. um uh my stepfather was into photography and he was artistic and everything like that so i mean there was music played around but it was nothing uh professional I guess my mom was a professional photographer for a little while, um, but she was more into communications and reading and writing and that kind of stuff. Graham, took you guys to DC. Uh, my stepfather got a job at the public defender service in Washington DC. Was he a lawyer or was he working just in the offices? He was an attorney. Nice. He was a public defender. Yeah. So he um, and it's a pretty uh, known as a pretty good a very good uh, public defender service in DC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very altruistic job too. I mean, that's a tough job and a hard one to do, but means a lot. Yeah, I think, uh, and then, yeah, exactly. Um, And so, okay, so take me through it. You end up in school, what are you in second grade in DC you join in? No, the first grade was kindergarten. Okay. So then I went, basically went between DC and, and Vernon, Texas in the summertime. There was a, uh, a small town where my father's side of the family lived. So I would go there and he remarried. So I had stepbrothers and a uh, half sister there or a sister there. And, um, my grandparents, uh, really my great aunt and uncle, uh, who raised my father were really, you know, big parts of my life and they were there. So, and then DC, I went to public school and um, kind of learned a lot about the music of like Chuck Brown and other go-go artists. And then also there was like a a DC punk scene that was going on with like uh, independent stuff coming out that 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 was kind of all around i wasn't i didn't go to a lot of punk shows or anything growing up but i went to some go-go's i was like you know hip-hop came in kind of toward the end of high school so got it nice and so at what point did you end up i guess what kind of work did you do throughout school were you ever like did you have other hobbies or did you gravitate towards music right away well like the first like i you know, the first, I played trumpet when I was in elementary school. They, they they would let you take 
an instrument home and and it, that was at the time so i was like i thought the trumpet was cool so i still think i was like i you know <laughs> <laughs> and trumpet players were cool and they looked cool so it was like all right uh, you know we'll, we'll do that um and uh but i don't think i really got the essence of the instrument i was kind of read music and didn't really read the music i was just playing it by ear so um there was some actually some good teachers i had a teacher named miss maxwell at lafayette she was good um and then went on and started a friend of mine had a guitar and was listening to like neil young records and he he showed me some chords and we started jamming when we were like 13 and stuff but i wasn't good at playing the instrument like i didn't feel like i was one of these guys that could play everybody else's song like a lot of other people could uh -huh. so i i i moved on and started writing poetry and and all that kind of stuff and and essentially uh you know later on developed back into the guitar after the drum machines but like to what, answer the what work that what drew you to that poetry like that's you know not uncommon but not common like did something specific drew you to writing poetry well my great uncle who was i was named after uh was like really close to me and he passed away right after high school and i went and stayed in vernon for that that time uh and you know just a lot of poems came out i was like where did this come from you know so that was like kind of a, a genesis to that and hip-hop was coming around and and i got i thought like drum machines were really cool so i got you know some drum machines and or a drum machine a little later but you know and you asked about the work like i you know did paper roots and stuff when i was seven and stuff like that and then had a small um lawn business a year out of high school nice. and i uh, you know like my junior year i started buying and selling tickets to concert and sporting events so i started like making good money while mm -hmm. i was in high school you know i didn't have any bills so. yeah nice um and so you get out of high school and you went right after high school back to vernon you were saying yeah well you know just, just to help my uh my great aunt and uncle and then i <laughs> went to went to a year and a half at texas tech which is a couple hours from them yeah. and uh my great uncle passed away and my aunt was there and she passed away about a year later so then i went to austin for a year and realized that i wasn't going to do school and i wasn't really a good student or a test taker or any of that kind of stuff but had some really good experiences with some classes and some teachers uh in some writing kind of situations which kind of brought a lot of confidence out in that aspect of me because i didn't feel like i had you know been you know heralded that way as a writer before and i, I got an opportunity for people to see what i was doing creatively so your teachers at texas tech really liked your writing that was a big yeah problem. there was one lady she was like you know clarence you're a genius and i was like oh, man I, i've never heard that about myself and it yeah. was uh it wasn't like an offhanded remark it was kind of like after i'd written some things and then also um interpreted some uh, like a william faulkner sh short story and, and kind of like just you know did a project on it and didn't really use many references just kind of what i thought it was about and yeah. she said you kind of came to the same conclusions that people have been studying him for years and you know came to so wow she, she really was, she was like really positive about my development in that and i thought I like I've, i've tried to find her just to let her know that i didn't end up in a gutter somewhere so <laughs> you aren't able her for that. yeah it was really hard to do like all my transcripts it it there's not much information on the who the teacher was so um, this out that's gonna, that'll be our follow-up we got to go find this teacher oh yeah i know we got to hold on what is this no problem uh, Where did you go? 
Who asked the window? The last year. Oh. Figure this out. Hey, Taylor. 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 It's all good, by the way. We can edit this out. Yeah, I don't know what just happened here. Are you on a Mac? No, I'm on an Apple. Yeah, if you go to the bottom, if you put your mouse to the bottom right, or bottom yeah. left, excuse me, you might see it pop up. Oh, Zoom us? Oh, there you are. Okay. Exactly. Perfect. Sorry. No, you're good. Um, all right, to kick back in. Okay, so... You had that experience with your writing teacher. You went back to help your great aunt. And funny enough, by the way, my great aunt and great uncle were like my grandparent figures in my life. So have that in common, which is cool. yeah. You, you know, you, you, some people don't understand that that yeah. that kind of dynamic. So when I used to be, you know, it was like it was a really close relationship, and yep. uh, so it, it it was. I'm I'm glad you understand that because yeah, no, like, oh, your grand uncle, you are so upset as that. <laughs> no, I mean, their relationship is literally what I idolize in terms of hopefully my relationship fifty years from now with my wife. Like they were, they passed away a few years ago, but they're they were amazing as well. So that's that's cool that you have that. But yeah. so you go back, you get out of school, you now have some encouragement and confidence around writing. What happened next? So I went down and and realized I wasn't going to be doing, um, you know, the school thing, went to Texas and 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 kind of had gotten a drum machine and then started to learn on a sampler and just kind of just woodshedded in Austin and in, in in an apartment in South Austin at the time. And um, it was actually a little house that I shared with legendary Matthew Looney from uh, Austin, and he, he's a known character. We went to a million shows, turned me on to a lot of good music, and and you know made, used to make posters and everything. So he's like just hang posters for events. You know, he was yeah. like the guy that would hang the posters and get paid to do so for shows around town. And got it. Learned a lot of stuff. So I just started getting really deep into the the learning how to sample and make songs and stuff like that. So I, I really didn't have any understanding as a listener of some of these songs, like how did they, how did music happen? You know, I didn't understand that whole, that whole idea. And, and I started kind of listening to records and sampling records and kind of understanding a little bit about the foundation of, of like songwriting. I guess. And was it at that, like, at what point did you decide, like, I want to be in music, I want to be a musician, I want to create songs, like, you were obviously doing poetry, you were a great writer, and you had some confidence around that, but when did you go, like, this, I feel like, is my life calling? Was it then, or did it take time after that? Well, I think, I think I'd done some demos there, but when I bought the sampler, I really kind of, one of those look in the mirror moments, and be like, you know, if, if you're going to take if you're going to do this, you're going to have to take it seriously, you know, because it's yeah. like it was kind of a one one of. Uh, a couple of times I've had to do that in my life um, and and just to reaffirm that that kind of commitment. And and so I just learned it and, and I didn't. I never, I guess, was I never kind of oversaw what I was doing musically or creatively i never like oh this is amazing you know i didn't really ever you know feel like that or or feel the really need to even talk about it that much um yeah. but i was just really learning and woodshedding so it was a it was a good period listening to a lot of music got it and so what was the next progression of it did you start to perform from there or what what happened? i did I did a couple little shows and I was doing more like spoken word, like lyrically more like almost like influenced by hip hop and rap, but I didn't have a flow. So <laughs> I can't even call it rapping. Um, so 
I, I went up, I moved out of Austin and went back to DC and I started, uh, basically just doing demos and all that kind of stuff as I was and selling tickets and during, you know, during that time and then kind of got deeper into it and was asked to be in this band called Basehead uh, to, to do some touring and cause I knew the samplers and stuff. And, and this guy, Michael Ivey, who was, you know, really, really amazing songwriter did some, did a record uh, when his senior year at, at Howard University and, and and kind of blew up kind of like independently and on media and 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 a lot of end of year best of lists and so so it was kind of a I got brought into that that kind of like under his guys as far as like learning the business as far as somebody who had done it professionally who started to do it professionally. So he kind of brought me in, in that sense where it's like, I, I didn't, you know, have any contractual obligations, but then it was like, you know, um, I, I could kind of benefit from learning what he was doing. Got it. And so how long were you with him? We did like a couple tours. So it was a couple years. Um, he did a couple records. So it wasn't even that long. And he decided to kind of go in a different direction as far as his life, just as, as far as like, I think he understood on a, on a real level, like what pursuit of entertainment was about, you know? So I think he kind of, you know, he was always a, a lot smarter than most people. So it was kind of, you know, he didn't, he didn't see the kind of trappings of, of enter the entertainment life as, something that you know he needed in his life i, I think got it and so when that ended what happened next <laughs> you got a little bit of the taste for it you i assume made some money and made a living working for a couple of years on music so yeah i was actually you know it, it it wasn't it was really the experience that i gained you know i you know it definitely get was able to for the first time get paid a paycheck to go and tour, you know, that was like, wow, you know, this is amazing. Yeah. And, uh, and travel and all that kind of stuff, go to Europe for the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, so then that I came back and, it, and I had all these drum machines and stuff. And I remember actually after doing a record in there, I was like, I can't even play my grandmother's song, you know, like, <laughs> so, so it, without all this, uh, I kind of went into the, doing the guitar and vocal and songwriting thing just from the guitar and writing perspective and then melded it with what I knew in the studio stuff. So it was like kind of creating a whole new different environment for the type of songs I was writing, you know. Yeah, got it. And so it, it did you end up once you left and did, when you went back to the guitar and stuff, were you by yourself or did you have a band at that point? Kind of how did that progress? I was just by myself. So I, was, I, I, I had a little uh, efficiency apartment in DC on Fuller Street, nice. Mozart, Mozart Place. And it was like, uh, luckily the neighbors were cool. I would, you know, sell my tickets during, you know, up until nine o'clock and then be there and then have all day to write. So it was like a really, and I'd wake up and it was across from a school and I hear these kids like playing in the, in the background so it was like a real uh you know when kids are playing in, in in big groups it's like almost like a screaming joyous kind of thing but also there's like these weird textures of 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 you know chasing all that kind of stuff so it was, it was like a good way to wake up in the morning to hear that and, and uh it, so i was just just doing that for a while and then I kind of stopped selling tickets and, and really just concentrated on that. So I was like, I didn't have any kind of just barely just doing a few events and, and really felt that moment of, of where I used to value having like that financial security. I just, I was, I was like, I'm good without it. And it was, it was a good moment of discovery. And that's when I started 
doing gigs, getting a band together. You know, I'd made the demos and then doing live shows with it and, you know, shopping the demos and all that kind of stuff. So were you just going as Clarence Greenwood at the time or how are you? I was it was Citizen Cope. Oh, okay. And then it was I was kind of going as I was kind of there was a decision I was going to make. It was like, who is Clarence Greenwood anyway? So I was thinking of going Clarence Greenwood at that point. So it was just it that was that was decided kind of later to keep it Citizen Cope. But it, it was where'd that come from? Where'd, where'd the name Citizen Cope come from? Cope is my nickname. It's short for Copeland. And uh, I w- when I was just doing demos, I was it had no really I'd heard Citizen Kane the movie I hadn't seen it and I was like oh Citizen Cope <laughs> <laughs> sounds like the name of my company it's like I, I wish I had some creative crazy story but this sounded good and this sounded good and it yeah. worked <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> um, that's awesome exactly. um, oh, it, yep. I can't beat that yep <laughs> um, so all right so you started putting a band together and then like did, with the live shows, like were you, what size venues did you start with? Were you playing like small bars or where did you really start? Well, even before the band thing, I would just, even if I couldn't get a gig, I would, I would um, play at a place and bring in a sound system, pay in a guy that had a sound system, bring it in and just charge whoever yep. I could. And then there were a couple of places called the Velvet Lounge. There was a place I played called the Velvet Lounge. And then uh, the 930 Club, uh, I would get some opening slots there. Uh, There's a woman named Lisa White there at the time that um, gave me a couple of really good opening slots and, you know, got, got some, got some write-ups in the paper from a local Washington Post guy, weekend section guy, and then started getting some more kind of buzz around what I was doing. And I was shopping demos at the, you know, sending tapes to everybody, calling everybody, not getting my, getting all the doors slammed in my face. And it was like FedExing people tapes and, you know, pretty much using the money I was making uh, and the ticket stuff to try to push this and, and, and go in the studio. And, and so I mean, I, I got a demo deal with Capitol Records uh, to make a long story short, somebody found it in an unsolicited pile and got like $5,000 and made the tape and incidentally had a show kind of similar to the time and, and a, another executive came down from Polygram Records and offered me a, like a proper deal. So I had like a record deal without a manager or a lawyer and kind of went up there to New York and you know, got on the train and they put me in a hotel and it, and then the people at Capitol end up hearing, you know, the demo deal that I did and they wanted to do it. And I ended up signing with them because I already had kind of signed a demo deal with them. So it was kind of put in their, uh, you know, house. And, and so that record didn't come out and I did, made a record for them and I got dropped from the label. So, I went on to make a uh, kind of spend a lot of the money that I got from the advance after taxes and had, had got a really cool place on 9th, 9th and O Street in the alley uh, in Shaw. It was a converted um, carriage house. So it was like 2,500 square feet. And at the time, it was like there was a lot of prostitution and drugs in the area. So it was like really, it's like $800. And um, I had this 2,500 square feet and I learned that I just sang out really loud. And, you know, I hadn't, I kind of had small space before sang out really loud and wrote a whole new record and went down to, I felt like I had a hit song and I real quick, just to clarify, yeah. Capital signed you, they paid for you to record an album, never released it and dropped you, but gave right. you, but gave you the, the upfront part of the fee which I guess at that point they dropped you. So they, they you don't have to worry about them recouping it at that point either. Right. Right. They, 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 they drop, they, when they drop you, or at least in my case, they drop you, but you get the advance. Right. But you're not going to get the record put out. You're not going to get the promotion. You're, on. you're not going to get the marketing. And yeah. I didn't get the record either. So they wouldn't give me the record that I made. 
So I had to write all these new songs and it was really a close record to me. So it was like a really difficult situation where I was like, oh, this is this is messed up because I have to write a whole bunch of new songs. And I thought I had some really big ones on this. Is it still shelved or did they ever (laughs) getting that back? I got that back. Okay. I got that that record back. Um, and so some of the songs that are on that that are on the new record that I'm putting out right now are actual acoustic versions of those songs that never came out. So it's like kind of a cool story to the new record. That's really cool. Yeah. All right. And so you end up writing a new album in your 2,500 square foot place that you were able to get. Yeah. And so where take me from there. And uh, I've been listening to Outcast records and, and there was this guy named Neil Pogue who had engineered and mixed a lot of the, the songs that I really liked and, and been involved in that. And I, you know, cold called him and I cold called uh, DreamWorks records and basically um, the lady from that answered Lenny Walker's um his is his assistant at the time. I mean, she's like an executive assistant, I guess. So this lady named Gail Pearson, and I just, you know, basically, you know, I don't know what I said, but it was enough to get her to. She she came in the in 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 Lenny Walker's office, who was the head of DreamWorks at the time, and what was at Warner Brothers, and had signed like Prince and um worked with obviously randy newman all the great acts neil young um and uh she said lenny i've never done this before but you got to take this this kid's call and i got on the phone and and it happened after capital so i guess i was like basically was like i you know got dropped already and i got this song i'm a big fan of what you know, Randy Newman's done and Lenny Mark, you know, Lenny and I just, I just needed to talk to him. And so she, I got on the phone and he gave me like 7,000 to go make this thing and uh, a new demo. So it was like a demo deal. And I called up Neil Pogue who'd done the outcast stuff. And I, I felt like I had this song, if there's love, it could be big. And, and I'd written salvation and love the way his stuff sounded. So he listened to my, the stuff that I had. And he's like, Oh man, this could be really, really amazing. Come down. So I went down and spent kind of the demo money on making that. And I had, if there's the song called, if there's love, which eventually got me, um, the deal, the deal to the next level. So it it was, it was a, a great experience. So like something that kind of went from a real bad position kind of brought me to another level. And so tell me about that deal. Like what happened? What was the next step there? Well, actually DreamWorks got it and they were like, man, you know, we like it, but we don't know what to do with it. And I had a, uh, so we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to do it. So I had this like demo, but I could take it everywhere. So I knew I had this great thing. And even though they didn't get it. So I said, uh, there was a guy named John Lachey who would, who would, worked at Warner Brothers and he's like, I'm going to shop this for you. So he shopped uh, the record and got this kind of like point where like Island, you know, Def Jam, Leo Cohen and Jimmy Iovine and Interscope wanted to do it. And a couple other big labels at the time, like Sony and, and then DreamWorks heard about all of it. And, and Michael Goldstone who would work with like Pearl Jam and stuff wanted it and I'd, I I'd kind of like liked Lenny Walker a lot because I you know I felt like they were a company that just had a really strong a and r vision for creativity um but they really didn't know how to market and promote so it was a kind of it was a difficult thing but I signed with DreamWorks and, and did that first record okay you did. how did it end up going that record when it came out was a flop so they <laughs> It was like, it was, it was, I, you know, I got this great piece in the Washington Post written up and, and it was looking, but it, it just, the record didn't, 
you know, DreamWorks, I think, had a hard time marketing, promoting music. So they were they they had these really prestigious executives there, but it wasn't really hungry. And then DreamWorks, like DreamWorks Pictures, is it the same company? Yeah, they had a record division at the time. It. So it was like Geffen, Spielberg, Katzenberg, and you, you know, they kind of pushed that it was going to be like there was going to be synergy between the music and the film and the television. And so it was kind of like looked on paper to be great. Mo Austin and Lenny Warnker were there. Um, but I didn't know enough about marketing promotion at the time, not to know that like, and, and, and so, and it's weird because when you're signing a record deal, you're going from like obscurity to talking to two or three or four people, sometimes 10 people wanting to sign you. And the time is limited where you can make your decision. Right. So it's like you go from, you know, scalping tickets to getting a record deal. Right. Essentially what happened. Right. And you, you don't necessarily have, know what you're looking for. I mean, it takes a lot. That's in almost any industry, any profession, anything. Yeah. Until you've gone through it, you don't really know what to ask or what to look for. And Yeah. I mean, I... I, I and I've read all the books and been to seminars and, and obviously spent tons of time in the studio and making records and, and all that stuff was ready up, you know, but like that other thing, you know, that's a whole other ball game. So it was like, it was a, it was a really cool, you know, chance to learn and, and a good experience. And so your the record flops. What is it? I'm curious. How does the label react? Do they blame you? Do they move on, or do they say, "Hey, let's figure this out"? Like, are they were they a good partner, so to speak? I think creatively, they were like all you know. I had a, a guaranteed you know couple records with them, so it was it was. I think they could easily drop me or whatever, but I I think I felt. So I came back and I, I I played him Sun's Gonna Rise and I played him Sideways for the for the and and I I kind of this time I went to to the West Coast and played it for some some of the radio people mm -hmm. and I didn't get the the kind of response that I thought it it, it should have garnered you know even somebody said you know you know that some songs are really great but they're just not marketable when they heard sideways. So I was just like, all right, cool, you know? And that was at about the time that Santana had asked to use sideways for his record. Cause I, you know, I, I had, yeah, that happened. <laughs> well, he heard it sideways was done and he had heard it from somebody at the record label that was a Coke fan and knew that I had had, had a new record, you know, I, I was working on my new stuff they asked me to submit something um, and my publisher at the time submitted it. Uh, okay. And, and so it, 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 it got, it got submitted and Carlos really liked it. And, and then the president of the label liked it. And, and so <clears throat> for some, and his family really liked it. And it was weird because I was the only like, no name artist to be on this record shaman because it was the follow up to supernatural that sold a gazillion copies and and uh so everyone was trying to get on this record and they knew it would debut like number one in so many different countries which it did and so sideways made it on it was like the only kind of artist that wrote and produced the song and and performed it and because a lot of this was like multi-songwriters and Bullet and a Target, did that come out on that album you were working on that was supposed to have Sideways on it or was it? No, well, what happened was that was the, when I did this, the, the thing with, with Arista, we were kind of like, I felt so like being around that Carlos record, I felt like the energy of this new label, like Arista, LA Reed had just come there. It was like a big pop record label, but also had, classic stuff so all the you know all the outcast stuff was on there but they would have Whitney Houston and they had you know so they had like but they didn't have anything like me and it was it was it was kind of like a really really perfect storm and they were really into sideways they were even thinking of putting that as a single and 
And so it kind of made sense for me to ask to be released from DreamWorks to go over to Arista because I felt like, you know, because they were like, you really want to stay over there, you know, kind of thing. And I was like, no, nah, not really. Uh, and I asked to be released and I had another record come in and made the record for Arista. And that's the Clarence Greenwood recordings. And it was just a great experience making that record. You know, I had to, you know, give a nice piece of my advance back to DreamWorks in order to leave. And, uh, but so that kind of forced me to write, produce and kind of the whole thing, you know, to produce the whole record yeah. myself. And, and so that was, you know, that record was great. And that, that was a success, right? That came out and did well for you. Yeah, that record did well. And the DreamWorks record end up coincidentally, you know, you know, drummer has gone platinum plus already. And, you know, that record will eventually go gold, but they yeah. took it off the shelves at 15,000. So it's like, you know, it's huh. already, you know, it, since it's came out, it's close to going gold, which is, you know, 500,000 copies and yep. have it as a platinum single on it. And, and, and that's with no radio play and no, no weeks in, in, in the billboard top 200. So that's like a consistent, amazing, you know, expansion. And then, you know, this, the Clarence Greenwood record came out. Uh, the second record was going to be on Ariston. I had the whole team together. And all of a sudden they were like, this is going to be our, you know, we're going to push this. This is going to be a, a priority. And then L.A. Reed got got fired and the whole Arista staff kind of got let go with the exception of a couple of people. So that record never came out on Arista and it was moved to RCA Records, which was kind of like another situation where I had to kind of just, you know, it wasn't ideal. Yeah, I'd go with it. Yeah. And how'd that do? Even through RCA, were they distracted? Well, it, just, it just took a long time. So it wasn't like they weren't going to put, you know, I, I, the politics are labeled like they had the artists that they had already signed. So I kind of came in and there was people at the label that were kind of pushing their artists because if their artists do well, then they end up, you know, getting promoted and stuff like that. So that was one of the things. And we didn't, same thing they didn't really go to radio on even the lowest form on those records so but what was beautiful about it is it like found its own life and we were able to you know get the buzz about that record out you know when i was still at arista they let me do ten thousand copies of the album and i gave up tons of copies out before the record came out of the whole album now yeah. it's when cds were still happening and like it was just like the best best thing I could have done at that time. So I was just like, just really doing that and developing the live thing and, and figuring out how to do residencies and touring and kind of make myself label proof so that that after the, the, the LA read thing happened, I was like, Oh, this can happen so many times. So let me make myself kind of like label proof as far as is that. What, what year was that? Like at that point when, when, that all happened that was 2004 okay so then you know i i, I, I built the, the touring up and then did another record for them in 2006 and then basically went and started to do my own stuff on my own label got it so you went independent around yeah that's yeah nice and so give me around the past 2008 that's what i want okay so give me the past 13 years how's it been since so it's been you know i've made these records i don't i haven't made a lot of them and uh, I've been, you know, touring a lot. I just woke, you know, I realized I've been around touring so much in these last, you know, this last year has kind of been an awakening for me. It's like, okay, you know, I've been under a rock in a lot of ways. So I, I, I kind of am, am, am enjoying, you know, pursuing other things, you know, Cause I, I got in this to write, to be a songwriter. And then it became performing became such a element of, of my existence. So. It, and so on that note, what's next? Like, where, where do you want to go? What, I know you're coming out with an album, but do you want to keep writing, get into touring? You just mentioned what, what kind of other stuff are you getting into? Well, I've been writing and I've just been interested in, 
the other creative side beside the touring stuff because I feel like the music thing is there's there's so many limitations because of you know there's there's industries being built around our intellectual property and then we're not at the table and then there's a lot of people artists that really kind of don't feel that responsibility to to be at that table and and so i'm kind of like just trying to take accountability for what's going on with all the different you know digital service providers and all the different things coming up right now that is being done there's like a huge transformation of content and wealth and music yep. copyrights being done over the last three years and will be done over the next 20. So I'm kind of like, want to be able to um, think about that for future artists and for past artists and kind of like also for myself, just to be accountable for what's really, really going on and, you know, trying to figure out a way to be at that table. Yeah, when you see the Disney pr family yeah. private equity fund buying Taylor Swift's masters, um, friend of mine, Tom Silverman has, you know, always been a pretty good legend in the hip hop space, but is buying tons of different masters and originals and the amount of money in music that didn't like 2008 was a rough time for the music business, but yeah. now it's back and it's a whole different game. And you're right. It seems to be transforming so fast and paying attention to that with your background could be super interesting. Um, yeah, it just seems like a lot's changing. That. <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's always changing. It just, it's just, Basically, there was so much to be made, but they didn't figure out how to how to make it. And I think other industries came in and knew knew what to do with it. And and part of that is is that there was, um, you know, you got to go with the founder. And and a lot of these people, you know, corporate record companies are doing businesses with, you know, doing deals with founders, yep. and they're not really gonna win against somebody with their own kind of like dream and aspirations against somebody that doesn't have they're not protecting that for themselves so it, it was, it was cool. i mean daniel eck is a great example actually even better is steve jobs he yeah. went to the record labels to build itunes originally they laughed him out of the room so he built it himself and then once they couldn't turn him down then he went back to him so yeah. something happened with daniel eck you know he was he didn't come to the U.S. for years because he built it overseas, where overseas licensing, they're like, whatever, go for it. And then by the time he came to the U.S., it was already a powerhouse. So, you know, that should have been Universal or Warner Music or one of these guys, you know, building that. But instead, you got a fun little party animal Swedish guy that builds this <laughs> company. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it should have been all of them working together because, you yeah. know, I think they should have all kind of figured that out. But then... You know, there's like they didn't have the tech element. And also, I don't know if they had the desire. It's like, I think they look at, you know, they're not trying, you know, it's not built that way. And I think that, I think now the companies are looking at more investing in other forms of, of business, like companies are investing in technology companies and all these other things, which yeah, I yeah. find interesting. Maybe I mean, it's smart in some ways, but it's like, wow, it's like you're going to invest in that, but not invest in building the content you have to actually yep. maximize the content would seem like a lot smarter thing to do, but, or else, or it's investing in enough, that and something else. But I totally agree. I mean, it's the amount of people, and we talked about this a little bit offline in terms of like NFTs, which are great technology and seem to have a lot of interesting stuff around it. But I don't know anything about it, so I'm not personally investing. And the amount of people I see that don't know anything about it but are jumping in, it's similar to tech, similar to crypto. A lot of people chase these gold rushes and think like, well, they made money in it, so if I put money in, so will I. And that's where people get hurt financially. Right, right. I think that there's always that mentality of going for something quick. Yep. You know, it's the same thing that brings people to the lottery and the casino. It's, exactly. just, it's just a little bit more higher stake money <laughs> same same uh emotional feel that like rush of adrenaline we're gonna make it i hope we do that's yeah yeah not the buy not the sell that's the funny thing it's putting the money down is where people get the high it's not whether they win or lose the high is on when they put the money on the table and i'm not just talking about casinos yeah yeah uh, it's interesting so last question for you 
What would be a piece of advice to someone trying to pursue their dream, whether it is music or whatever it is, art, et cetera, someone that really, you know, has that passion, wants to get there. What would be the one thing that you think they maybe haven't heard, but should? I think the most productive time creatively and like spiritually and, 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 you know, when I did the best stuff, I, I, I was able to listen to and follow my first instinct. And, you know, a lot of times that first instinct, once you start gaining a little bit more success, that there's a lot of people that, that will give you their opinion on that first instinct. But like, if you're able to be in a place where you can practice that to start and kind of develop that, that, that instinct to go with, that's really important and you know finding kind of some kind of mentorship whether it be you know financial somebody telling you put an ira up or figuring out that even if you don't make any money figure yep. something like that out um and just have accountability for what what you're going to do as far as you know the business and 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 the creative and that's really the most thing to, to make what you got really, really good. <laughs> if, you, if your product, your music, whatever it is, is really yeah. good and everything else comes pretty easily. Yeah. And I think it's like, and put your heart into it and, and follow something you love. Well, Clarence, this has been awesome. Thank you so All much right. for coming on Hawk. Thank you, Eric. Good All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. You've been listening to the Hawk Media Podcast. To ensure that you never miss an episode, make sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.